Congressman Mark Green just returned from the border. He is a Republican on the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committee. And when you hear Jean Karine Jean Pierre give these kinds of, of remarks and answers, it's baffling to, to people who are, are, are savvy to what's going on at the border, sir. Yeah, it's infuriating because it's uh, intentional deception. You know, when we were down there on the border, Trace, we, we were told by CBP that they were ordered to turn off the seismic uh, fiber optic sensors, ordered to turn off the cameras. I mean, you look at everything, whether it's the 2023 budget for Homeland Security or this interim final rule that they're trying to implement, everything is designed to speed people into the United States. And the drug cartels know this, so they target one sector with mass waves of people. CBP pulls people from one sector of the line over to process those individuals, and then the drugs just come pouring into those empty sectors. We witness this firsthand. One of the things about your trip, it just reminds everyone about the fact that President Biden is never gone. Vice President Harris is never gone. And when you go and you see it firsthand, and we're looking at some of your video that you provided here, uh, it really must shock the system. And now you see Go Governor Abbott making some decisions about sending migrants into sanctuary cities. And I, I wonder what you, what you heard about that down there, if anything, if they're aware that the CBP knows that there is at least the governor trying to figure out a way to get some attention focused on this issue. Yeah, while we were down there, uh, we saw the news clippings from Governor Abbott sending folks to Chicago. Now he's you know, he's sending bus, buses of migrants, illegals, to New York City, Washington, D.C., and Chicago. And, you know, the CBP guys are celebrating this because they recognize it helps educate America, uh, particularly these sanctuary cities, to what's really going on at the border. It's amazing to me, and I want to put these numbers up on the screen if I can. This is call for number four. This is fentanyl seizures at the border, Congressman. And, and you can see here, through this year alone, we're talking about 10,000-plus pounds of fentanyl. That's enough to kill millions. Since 2019, it's almost four times the amount. And the deaths since 2019 have doubled. Now, the administration's response is, look, see, we're interdicting all this fentanyl. And you think, but wait a minute, the death rate is going way up. It means that there is a ton of this stuff actually getting through and killing people. Yeah, when we were at the border, you know, meeting with ranchers who actually are in the areas that CBP can't cover, again, they showed those game cameras of people who are in camouflage wearing, uh, you know, backpacks full of drugs. And we actually went to one of the sites where they they have a drop-off point, pickup point, and there were hundreds of backpacks and carpet shoes, discarded, empty backpacks that we know were carrying drugs. They're at these drop-off sites. They meet a prearranged vehicle that then takes them all over the country. That We've had in Tennessee a 50% increase in fentanyl deaths. Yeah. And that's really just one cost of the president's, uh, you know, by, board Border policy, uncompensated care at our hospitals has skyrocketed. A hospital, a small hospital, with a twenty million dollar increase in lost revenue due to you know taking care of migrants who don't have insurance. And what happens is Americans wind up those who have insurance paying for that. Local jails have seen a forty to fifty percent increase in incarcerations because the people who are coming across, not at the crossing sites, but are sneaking in, have all committed crimes before. Many of the multiple crimes they don't want to report to CBP, so they just come across the border. Forty percent increase in these jails, that's millions of dollars in daily cost to taking care of inmates. I mean, the costs are human lives, uh, budgets of local governments, every American paying for, for higher hospital costs to cover the uncompensated care. It, it's just, it's insane what the president is doing. I just see, I, I want to ask just one quick question. I won't play the sound bite. Let me just read something that Corinne Jean-Pierre said to Peter Ducey yesterday about fentanyl increases. She said, so what I will say that you are seeing a 200% increase of fentanyl seizures, which means that we are doing the job of catching a drug trafficker 200%. That's that's the, what she said. Your quick reaction to that? 
that's deception because they know for a fact the CBP guys are telling them, showing them the video that we're showing them of this increase in uh, fentanyl that is going around. And they find these empty backpacks, they find these drop-off centers, they know what's going on. They're being deceptive when they say seizures have increased and therefore we're getting all the fentanyl. Mm -hmm. uh, we know not. the number of gotaways. They're, yeah. yeah. Congressman, thank you for being with us today and for going on the trip, sending us the video, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. Academic achievement falling to levels not seen in decades. How can we help get America's kids back on track? Ever better. It's when you're ever connected with Rideshare, our digital platform that provides real-time visibility and collaboration on goods moving across your supply chain. In it's really, really sad because we have a um, we have a uh, uh, sheriff here in Weekly County, Tennessee, that is fixing to retire after nine terms. He's been in he's been in service now for about 34 years. And to think that uh, well, school's back uh, in session, and the impacts of to think that people are supposed to praise and pat this person on the back after coming into power, and I ain't just talking about him necessarily, but all of them that's been in there long term. Um, to think that we're supposed to congratulate these people. What are we congratulating them for? For allowing for our country to be turned totally upside down to the degree that now uh, suicides and drugs and drug overdoses has become a predominant thing in our in our land. You know, it's one thing if a fireman has to give his life going into a burning house to save. Uh, a group of people or children or whatever. It's one thing for a deputy to give his life. Uh, recently, we just had a state trooper here in Tennessee that was flying a helicopter and got it into some power lines and caused his death. Um, that's dying an honorable death. Those that give their life in sacrifice for their for their uh, for their sworn duties that they have sworn to protect and take care of. They're citizens, but for people just to be dying, just to be dying. I told them, I told them before Donald Trump ever become president, what they should do is build a dam and create uh, uh, turbines. That way they could create electricity and widen the water. That way wouldn't nobody attempt to go over the Rio Grande. More apparent. But I wouldn't listen to because I'm supposed to be a nut. So there you go there. It's just, it's absolutely uh, asinizing in, in how that our country has went belly up. Reports show test scores are down, with the New York Times saying the pandemic has erased two decades of progress in reading and math. Here to weigh in is Marilyn Muller. She is a pro bono literacy advocate and a mom. These numbers are shocking. They are a little bit terrifying because of what it means for the future. But you understand it firsthand. How so? Well, our daughter started kindergarten in a Massachusetts um, public school and um, very quickly showed um, signs that I now know um, are associated and linked with reading failure. Um, she was frustrated by the task. Um, she would avoid the task and um, those behaviors would manifest with a um, refusal to go to school. And in the afternoon when she would get off the bus or I would pick her up at school, she would um, get into her safe space in the car and, and have what's called a, basically a meltdown mm -hmm. after school restraint. And so she, she's better now. She's in a, you, you moved, you have her in a private school. She is able to read. What, you're a pro bono literacy advocate. So when you see numbers like this, what do you think the, the scope and scale of the problem is and what should we figure out a way, how should we figure out a way to help parents and the teachers who are probably upset by this too, turn things around? Well, our teachers, um, our educator preparation programs um, are not uh, including the science of reading in their curricula. So we have teachers that are in the classroom 
who are um, passionate about serving children and improving lives with literacy, but they don't have the tools that they need um, to teach these children how to read appropriately. And so our educator preparation programs are failing teachers. And um, then we have, you know, edu like educrats and bureaucrats that are having these um, debates about how we teach children to read, but yet we have science, 50 years of science um, that tells us how the brain pathways work and which neural pathways mm -hmm. are firing when children are tasked with reading. And so we need to be supporting our teachers and training them appropriately so that they have the knowledge and the tools and the skills um, to ensure that each child can read proficiently. Average schools in reading and math is a call for number one. Uh, in two, 2022, declined two, to 215 out of a possible 500. That is falling five points from 2020. Math scores fell seven points to 234. And the Department of Justice has said this, that the link between academic failure and delinquency, violence, and crime is welded to reading failure. You wrote, you sent some statistics to our producers that were very shocking in regards to the incarceration. I don't doubt that in today's society because in today's society, you most, you just about have to be able to read in just everything from banking to pumping gas to um, doing whatever. And if you're completely illiterate out there, you're not going to make it. And of course, this is the stem off from it or the trade-off from it toward people resulting in the crime. And it wasn't just the two years of the COVID that we went through or two and a half years of COVID that we went through. It's been a long-term process towards illiteracy here in America that uh, I think it was Nancy Reagan that was that put a finger to that towards realizing that that was one of America's problems in our schooling system that even to this day still has never been fixed. So whenever I talk about me being an eighth grade dropout, it wasn't because I was stupid. I'm far from being stupid, or I think that I am. Uh, I got some, you know, handicaps. I got some hangups uh, myself that I'm trying to get over on a day-to-day -day level. But uh, if I didn't devote my time and energy into a career, I first started out in the construction career, that blowed up in my face whenever I fell off of a building. And then I pursued another career, which was the auto body career. But if I didn't pursue an actual career towards learning and being learned, I would probably be just as illiterate today as what I was whenever I dropped out of eighth grade school. Um, or ninth grade school, I got eighth grade education, uh, ninth grade school in, in Westview because I knew that uh, it was going to be too tough for me to go to school. So I learned a skillful occupation towards working with my hands versus working with my head. I wish now that I'd uh, gotten more education. I wish now that I would have had the opportunity to have gotten more education. But, you know, how many more of these children are going to sift through the cracks before people are going to start doing something about it. It's one thing to recognize it, and it's another thing to do something about it. Been all detention. Tell us more here. So, according to the data, 70% of incarcerated and 85% of the youth in juvenile detention centers do not uh, read above a fourth grade level. And that is we so know sad. that reading is fundamental. We know that um, reading is not natural and it should be explicitly taught. But these, this methodology of ex direct explicit instruction is not available in most um, K to three classrooms where the foundations are laid for the skills for literacy for life. Um, what is, it, what is and someone's that life is some like when, they, when you can't read? Well, um, typically the research will show that they uh, suffer from low self-esteem, uh, they feel powerless, um, they can suffer from depression and anxiety, which links to other types of behaviors um, such as crime, right. drug abuse, um, and leads you down a pathway to what we call the school to prison pipeline. Right. Which, To me, it's, um, it, it robs you of the pursuit of happiness. And we have to figure Absolutely. out a way.
to deal with this. Marilyn, thank you for your expertise in coming on today, and good luck to you and your family there in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I mean, you know, Barbara Bush, uh, former first lady, uh, the, the late Barbara Bush, she Focus on literacy because right. this problem, unfortunately, it seems to be getting worse. Yeah, in schools across the country, and COVID did not help. In fact, COVID exacerbated Made it the so much worse. And, then and I may have uh, misspoken a while ago. It may have been Miss Bush uh, that was involved in the illiteracy program here in America beyond, uh, beyond the Reagans. Um, it's almost as if we have two different worlds. We got one world that's a high tech world pertaining to high-tech advanced technology talk his name is chunk and apparently chunk and then we got another world that has been left behind pertaining to people being illiterate and can't really catch on of doing nothing and of course drugs has an, exacerbated the problem and of course uh covid as they're talking about here has exacerbated the problem and there's been other things that has exacerbated the problem towards not paying enough attention to taking care of teachers and etc and it's created this uh this wide gulf of stigma that is now sadly attacking our our children and attacking our future almost like a disease. To the Faulkner Focus, I'm Sandra Smith in for Harris today. The first busloads arrived last night to their new drop-off location in downtown Chicago. Texas Governor Greg Abbott in a statement saying, quote, Mayor Lightfoot loves to tout the responsibility of her city to welcome all regardless of legal status. Lightfoot's office calls Abbott's busing plan racist. House Oversight Ranking Member James Comer giving props to the Texas governor. I think uh, many more blue cities are going to have to be sent migrants, uh, but this is working. This was a great idea by Governor Abbott. All the fentanyl that's coming across our border, all the human trafficking that's coming across our border, all the crime that's coming across our border is a direct result of the Biden administration uh, having an open border policy, welcoming these people across the border. And I am glad that these big city mayors thanks to Governor Abbott, are now seeing the problem with having an influx of people that come in. Matt Finn's live in Eagle Pass, Texas. He's on the ground there with a look at the overwhelmed border towns where migrants first cross over into the country, Matt. Good morning, Sandra. A lot of the migrants who are being bused to Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C., they cross into the country right here in Eagle Pass, Texas. This is one of the busiest ports of entry in all of the southern border. Uh, and we want to show you live now some drone video of an ongoing rescue mission in the Rio Grande River. The river is raging very fast right now. The water levels are very high because there's been a few days of rain here. Uh, and so the National Guard is out in the river with rafts and boats uh, attempting to rescue and help facilitate migrants who are coming from the Mexican side of the river here into the United States. Over the past couple of days, uh, some of the migrant groups have kind of slowed down because the river was moving so fast. Now it's picking back up again today, uh, and we're seeing migrants make a potentially deadly cross into the Rio Grande River that is moving very fast, and the National Guard is doing everything they can uh, to prevent any more drownings here. So we'll keep you updated on uh, the rescue mission happening right now. This morning on land, we've seen the upwards of about 150 migrants cross uh, into the United States by foot. Uh, others who swam across the river so far, some of them are standing right next to me. They're soaking wet, hugging their loved ones. There's a mother hugging a child because they made it across the river alive. And Fox News recently did a ride along with the police chief in the small town of Ensenal, uh, Texas, not far from the border. And during that ride along, the police chief pulled over a man from San Antonio who said he drove to the border to see his aunt, but then he admitted he was given coordinates to pick up migrants. And and would get paid based on how many fit into his truck. And the police chief tells us that smugglers these days don't always look like a menacing criminal. Now it's everyday people who might want to make some quick money by just picking up some migrants and giving them a ride. We have nurses that have done it, teachers. We have teenagers that are being targeted because you, you know easy money for a teenager. One of the one of the eldest persons that we've apprehended was 77 years old, a, a woman. 77 year old woman out here uh, picking up people that she doesn't even know, uh, you know, all for a quick buck. And switching from Texas to Southern California, a group of migrants with people from 12 different nations was apprehended Tuesday morning by Border Patrol just south of San Diego. Some of the migrants were from Somalia, 
India, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Pakistan. Uh, and here on the border, as we have been reporting, the DEA is giving that dire warning about the rainbow-colored fentanyl. Uh, the DEA says designed to look like candy and appeal to uh, children and young adults. They say that Mexican cartels are bringing the majority of that candy-colored fentanyl into the United States right here at the border. Sandra. All right, Matt, thank you. This posted live from there for us. Thank you, Newt Gingrich, now a Fox News political analyst and a former uh, House speaker. Great to see you, Speaker. Thank you very much for joining us. Do you agree thank with you. this move by the Texas governor to continue to send these bus loads of migrants now to cities like Chicago as well? Well, I think Governor Abbott represents the desperation that you get along the border states. I mean, whether it's Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, uh, to some extent, California, uh, the sheer number of illegal immigrants pouring in, uh, well over 2 million so far in the Biden administration. And if you count the ones that they're not catching, maybe as much as 3 million people have poured in. And some of them are dangerous. We were just told, I think, yesterday that three illegal immigrants apparently are being charged with killing a deputy sheriff in North Carolina. So I think what Abbott's done is pretty clever. He's saying to all these northern liberal states, you know, if you, you want to be a sanctuary city, you know, let, let me ship you a whole bunch of folks so you can practice being a sanctuary. And I think that the, the liberal mayors all of a sudden find themselves faced with, you know, the realization that the, the problem on the border can't just be a Texas problem. It is an American problem. And I think Governor Abbott's right to try to communicate that to the whole country. And it is also an American problem now to deal with this massive amount of drugs that are flowing over the border. And now there are more massive drug seizures that we are seeing happen at the border, Speaker. Agents found nearly $12 million worth of cocaine in a shipment labeled baby wipes near Laredo, Texas. That's nearly 2,000 packages of the drug, the biggest cocaine bust in 20 years. It comes after a warning about rainbow fentanyl coming over the border. The White House was pressed on that yesterday. A big problem now that rainbow fentanyl, what specifically is the president doing about this? We just talked about uh, uh, the day, the overdose awareness day that, uh, uh, that we are uh, observing today. So again, life seizures. expectancies are going down uh, at a rate not seen in a century, and part of that is being driven by drug overdoses. We see those same numbers as well, but the fact that we are, uh, you know, we are securing the border, uh, the fact that we are securing record levels of funding uh, from DHS so they can stop illicit drugs from entering into the country. The it's look, not look, being look. stopped. 300 overdoses. I hear you. I just, I just laid out 200% of increase of drug fentanyl seizures. So many fentanyl's coming in. People are dying. This is something that's incredibly important to this president. So to say that we're not doing enough, Peter, is just falsely, categorically wrong. If Republicans want to help us stop overdose and stop our kids getting overdose because of these dangerous drugs, because of these fentanyl that we're seeing in the streets, we're happy to work with them, but they're not. So is the goal to blame Republicans for the drugs flowing over our southern border? Look, look the, the level of dishonesty in that interview is astonishing. <clears throat> the fact that they could suggest that they're controlling the border. You just saw footage of how uncontrolled the border is. Uh, and this is an administration which every single day lies to the American people. Uh, and I think <clears throat> we also have to recognize something which neither party has taken on as much as you're going to have to, and that is that in many ways Mexico is becoming a failed state. Uh, the cartels have enormous power in Mexico, and as long as the cartels are as powerful as they are, I think they're a real danger to the United States, not just from drugs, but presently they're going to start exerting the same kind of violence here that they routinely exert in Mexico. And I think that's something people need to really think about. We've got a long period of assuming our southern border was safe. Now it's not only open, but our next door neighbor is increasingly dominated by very violent organizations uh, that are, I think, ultimately going to also seep into the United States and who get most of their money, frankly, from sales in the United States. Cocaine marked as baby wipes, fentanyl looking like children's candy. Um, it is a scary, scary time um, watching all those drugs flow over the border. We appreciate you joining us, Newt Gingrich. Thank you very much. Glad to do it. All right.
Well, a federal judge is set to hear arguments in just a couple of hours. The hearing over former President Trump's request for an... It was Donald Trump that nailed it by saying that it was an invasion. And to be quite honest with you, if this was to have been going on <clears throat> after the Revolutionary War towards what we're dealing with now coming from Mexico, it would be declared as an act of war from our Congress. And we would bring United States military down there and we would stop them one way or the other, even if it meant stopping them with death. Once more, I come up with a solution to the problem that nobody wanted to listen to, pertaining to the same type of solution that they tamed the Tennessee River with back in the uh, 1920s, 1930s, is whenever they began that project, TVA, towards damming up uh, the river and making the expansion so wide that nobody would even attempt to try to swim over it or go through it uh, unless they was uh, professional swimmers, much less ho holding a child in their hand or having a child on their back. Um, but nobody wanted to listen to that. That would have put millions and millions of people to work. It would have created electricity for both sides, either Mexico side or the American side. And it would have prevented a great deal of the people from coming over the Rio Grande. I'm not saying that it would have been foolproof. But the thing about it is, whenever you're looking at a plane that's that's basically smooth, like a body of water, say like the Tennessee River, you can actually put put uh, up uh, barriers to where you have like uh, activation cameras to where if something is moving above the water, give or take about a foot, foot and a half above the water, it automatically uh, sets off an alarm the alarm automatically sets off a camera and whoever's on the back end of the camera can sit there and see that if it was just a fish that jumped out of the water or a big log that was going down through the river or if it was actually a human being towards trying to cross you could monitor that situation so much more better if you was monitoring it up on top of water up on top of a, a, a water plane because you wouldn't have obstacles in the way like you do <clears throat> in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, Rio Grande River. Rio Grande River. There are some spots it's it's almost dry, and there's other spots that it, it's almost fierce for to even think about going over. But those spots it's fearful fearful towards going over. Hardly ever anybody goes over those spots because they know that if they do, they're going to endanger their lives. So it slows down uh, the transport in area in that particular area. And what they'll do is walk down or walk up uh, three or four miles, maybe 10 miles, whatever it takes. And they'll find them an area that ain't near as, as uh, treacherous. And that's where they'll attempt to cross over the river. Now, a lot of them uh, has gotten caught and they thought that they could do what they thought that they could do. And inevitably, they wound up uh, being being in trouble that some of them has actually died in trying to cross the Rio Grande. I'm just saying that now, because things wasn't taken care of, uh, give or take five, five or six years ago, now we're in a situation to where damned if we do and damned if we don't. And I realize what it's going to look like on camera. Uh, by going over there with military squadron and basically shoot shoot to kill anything that tries to cross over the river like that. But the bottom line is this. If the Mexican government would have done their jobs, we wouldn't be dealing with this invasion right now, just like Donald J. Trump talked about towards all these illegals coming over the Rio Grande. And they're not just coming over the Rio Grande there. You got Cubans that's still trying to cross from Cuba down to, to uh, Florida, which is about 70 or 90 miles. And then you got people coming from other parts of Canada, up towards Maine, up towards, uh, up towards the uh, Niagara Falls area. Uh, you got people that's coming, very few people coming through the center uh, of the of the Canadian border, 
uh, Canadian and United States border. But if you go on over to the west side, over towards Washington State, that is another area, another hot zone, where you got people from not only Canada, but you got people from Russia and and probably two or three other different... It These are all compromising weaknesses that... Uh, that our government officials has not been willing to look at and deal with for the past 30 plus years that has gotten us in this trouble we're in. And I realize what it would look like in the eyes of, of the global society if we had military forces down there, and I'm talking about federal military, I ain't just talking about National Guard, if we had airplanes and tanks down there towards shooting and killing people because of them trying to escape uh, the environment that they're in, in which on another perspective, I can look and see where things has gotten extraordinarily tough in Mexico and South America pertaining to the drug lords. And I can see where a family, uh, let's say a, a father had two two daughters or, or three girls or whatever down there. I wouldn't want my children to have to live in an environment like that neither. So I can actually see both sides of the perspective, but at the same time, I can also see where the failure of our government officials has, has allowed or brought us to this point to where now we're at a situation of damned if we do and damned if we don't. I'm glad that I don't have to make that decision. I don't get paid. Uh, it's above my pay grade to have to make decisions like that. And once more, I keep telling people where we have failed is that we did not, uh, the, the White House and the church uh, society, or the so-called church society here in America, did not uh, acknowledge this message towards it being an authentic, godly message. It was kicked to the curb. Uh, basically, the founder of the Windmill Ministries was put out on the limb, um, and they was hoping that eventually I would have either given up on this quest or that I would have been stupid enough to have shot myself in the foot to the degree of either being institutionalized for the rest of my life or being in prison for the rest of my life or I would have gotten killed or I would have killed myself and none of the above has, has, has occurred. None of the above has occurred. You know why? Because God the Father was on my side and God the Father was trying to keep me alive just like he was trying to keep me alive whenever that 1979 Buick Regal rolled over on top of me and I cried out, oh God, help me because I was smart enough to cry out to God at that time, even though an hour before that, I was blaming God and cursing God for all my problems, not realizing that I was beating the horse on the wrong end. And that's exactly what the American people are doing right now by blaming God for all these problems, because the problems has originated from Lucifer, the Luciferian Lucifer, the spiritual uh, demonic forces that has blinded humanity, and now we have brought these problems up onto ourselves. But yet now we want to keep continually blaming the Heavenly Father and blaming the Lord Jesus Christ. And people want to continue to keep keep uh, becoming cold and callous towards, towards uh, the true uh, church sector. So it, it's definitely a demonic movement that has occurred here for the past 30 plus years. And if you'll combine it with COVID, if you'll combine it with the war, if you'll combine it with inflation, if you'll combine it with people not paying attention to global warming pertaining to the oil, petroleum uh, typhoons out there, if you'll combine everything together, guess what? You got an ingredients for a perfect storm. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now, not just on the southern border, not just pertaining to illegals, but all of the above, from fentanyl to children now that are disobedient to to uh, their parents and children uh, that are disobedient to the to the uh, to the law pertaining to uh, authority figures. You have got a total breakdown, a total breakdown of basically order. A, a total breakdown of order, not only here in America, but a total breakdown that is now becoming more and more apparent all over the world. A global breakdown where you've got all these different cultures and all these different societies and all these different uh, 
communication problems towards people not being able to communicate because people speak, uh, you know, all these different languages and stuff, you got a breakdown. And in the exchange of the breakdown, you got consequences. In the exchange of the consequences, you got an evolving, worsening situation that's even going all the way down to the literacy programs that I've continued to keep talking about, that so many children now are falling through the cracks because you got children having children, you got parents having, you got children having children that's become parents and they themselves hasn't lived out their lives because of all this open sexuality stuff. One problem exacerbates another problem. It snowballs and that's where we are right now as a society and that's the reason why I say uh, that it's more crucial right now than what it's ever been for the UN to be where they're at right now over in Ukraine towards trying to deal with that with that plant over there that, that they've had to shut down the uh, two reactors again this week because of bombing but it's ever so much more crucial today because I truly believe that if that factory was to was to uh, melt down like like some other factories have melted down, especially like the one that melted down in Russia, I think it was in nineteen I think it was in nineteen eighty seven or nineteen eighty six, somewhere along in that area, whenever there was a total meltdown. Um, if that was to occur during the center of a war, see whenever that meltdown happened. During the time that it happened, the J J J I don't forget the name of it now, J Genova, uh deal that happened in Russia, uh, it you know whenever that happened during the time that it happened, um, there wasn't war going on. Now there's war going on. Now if people start dropping like flies and start dying a humiliating, cruel death, the next thing that you know, uh, people's mindset will change, and it's like, well, we'd all be better off if we just. Uh, press the big buttons and everybody just dissipated at, at one time. Uh, how we were going to handle children was largely driven by the teachers' unions. I I've written oversight letters in terms of communication between the CDC and our health agencies and the teachers' unions, and I've gotten no response. So this was not driven by science. Remember how everybody was vilifying Sweden because they didn't shut down uh, their schools? Their, their children went to school, didn't wear masks. Uh, Sweden's death per million is only 50, 59% of America's. 1,894 people per million versus U.S. 3,223 people dead per million. So not one of those 1.9 million Swedish, uh, Swedish school children died of COVID, and the teachers actually had a lower infection rate. So our response, driven by people like Fauci and our federal health agencies, are they're not honest, they're not transparent. They miserably failed in protecting Americans, and they've done great harm to our children. Yeah, I'll ask you more about how you and the Republican Party, if you regain control, plan to hold uh, people like Dr. Fauci accountable. While I also note, by the way, the minority groups that are hit the hardest by that lost learning. In math, black students lost 13 points compared with five points among white students, widening that gap between the two groups, Senator. Meanwhile, I want to ask you about this massive student loan handout. I mean, you're talking about $500 billion, but the White House senator as you well know, continues to insist that this is all paid for. How? With deficit spending. Because of a drop in the federal deficit, this won't cost Americans anything. To that, you say what? Well, they're completely detached from reality. You know, as I've been traveling around the state the last few days since this was announced, this is a major uh, area of, of conversation, and people are, are outraged by it. You know, individuals that worked hard, sacrifice paid off their own student loans or people are working hard and never went to college at all that that isn't just the debt is just being canceled it's being transferred onto their backs it's grotesquely unfair and people are, are very upset about it again what uh, i think it was the ken wharton study uh, or estimate about a trillion dollars there's not a trillion dollars of deficit relief and i doubt there's going to be deficit relief and relief in anything the democrats have done they are spending uh, as John McCain said, like drunken, drunken sailors, and that's an insult to drunken sailors. Mm. Completely out of control. 
our spending is completely out of control, and this is just going to add to the mortgaging of our children's future. But still, they are insisting, and they're out there doing interviews, insisting Jared Bernstein on another network saying this. Listen. Take credit for lowering the deficit by a trillion dollars because we're no longer spending it on these emergency things and saying, therefore, okay. we somehow got this slush fund of $1.2 to work with. That is disingenuous, and we haven't heard anything better from the Biden administration on where well, you're going to pay for this. I mean, they're having a hard time explaining to the American people how the lower income Middle class American families aren't going to be on the hook for this. Well, listen, we're $30.8 trillion in debt. Our annual deficits are exceeding a trillion dollars. And yes, we spent the, during COVID, the COVID relief, unfortunately, Democrats piled on another $1.9 trillion of deficit spending, money we don't have. That's what sparked inflation. Now, Sandra, a dollar that, that you held at the start of the Biden administration is only worth 88.3 cents. That is devastating for seniors on fixed incomes. Devastating for all of us. They have completely mismanaged our, our economy. Uh, two quarters now of negative growth. Our economy is shrinking. That's called a recession. And now they're you know, throwing another trillion dollars of debt burden on the backs of our children and grandchildren. This is outrageous. It has to stop. Senator, uh, you mentioned Dr. Fauci a short time ago uh, and you wanting to hold him accountable um, for, for the shutdowns and the lost learning that we just talked about. And we are hearing more and more Republicans, members of your party, vowing retribution if you do win back the majority uh, in either the House or the Senate or both in the midterm elections. Some of the targets we've heard from your party, Dr. Fauci, A.G. Garland and President Biden himself. Who is a priority for you, sir? Listen, I want the truth. The priority to me is the truth. We need to expose what happened. We need to expose the corruption. We need to expose the fact they weren't following science. They politicized COVID. We need to expose the fact that they did not robustly explore early treatment with a cornucopia of cheap generic drugs that I believe work because I've referred a lot of patients to doctors who use them. So I just want the truth. I'm not going after anybody. I just want the truth because the American public deserves the truth. They need to understand what happened so it doesn't happen again. What do you believe is going to happen come the fall? I'm not a political pundit. I've got my own tough race. So by the way, Ron Johnson for Senate.com uh, if you want these truths exposed. Okay. I appreciate you joining us, Senator. Thanks so much for your time today. Have a good day. All right. New York Governor Kathy Hochul, meanwhile, claiming the days of good guys with guns are over. The critics are firing back. Plus, there is this. California always thinks that it's the vanguard. They're leading the way. And uh, this is a glimpse into America's future. It certainly is a glimpse into one path. Uh, uh, I would argue it's the wrong path. So, just days after California announced its plan to ban gas-powered cars by the year 2035, they are asking residents to cool it on charging their electric cars. Our power panel is up next. My name is Joe. I always thought I was eating healthy, but I was never really eating enough fruits and veggies. There's a lot of confusion out there. This vitamin is good, this vitamin is Because um, that only makes people less safe. This whole concept that a good guy with a gun will stop the bad guys with a gun it doesn't hold up. Well, I guess we know where New York's governor stands on the state's new gun laws that take effect today. Critics are pointing to numerous incidents nationwide. They show that good guys and gals armed in public places actually have saved many lives. Legal gun owners taking down shooters in malls, 
churches and cafes over the years. Some on social media say the real reason for violence is obvious. One writing criminals no longer fear punishment because they know Democrat district attorneys will have them back on the streets within hours. That soft on crime position starting to hurt Hochul support among Democrats as well. And the New York Post editorial with this. Sorry, Hochul, your bail reform fixes don't cut it. So stop passing the buck. Jano Caldwell, Fox News political analyst and Desiree Timms, Democratic former Ohio congressional candidate. Welcome to both of you. Jano, uh, you and I have had a, an extensive conversation most recently about the crime that we're seeing in Chicago. You know, now you've got the New York governor basically saying there's never a reason where a good guy or a gal with a gun can make a situation better, especially in a city where soft on crime policies are letting these criminals run rampant in the streets here. Yeah, clearly she hadn't heard of the Indiana mall shooter who stopped a mass shooting in 15 seconds. You know, when you think about what's going on in New York, you look at the numbers that came out in July, 30 percent increase in all overall crime. Um, six of uh, six of seven major crime indexes show that a 40 percent increase in grand larceny, almost a 40 percent increase in other areas. This has become disturbing what we're seeing across our great American cities. New York City was a beacon of light for so many people. Immigrants came from all over the world to settle there, and now immigrants from all over the world are scared to visit there. This is so disturbing. Not to mention the fact with this bail reform that took place in 2020, the one that took effect in 2020, is really allowing criminals to go in and out of the system. Judges have less discretion when it comes to uh, what amounts they can put on in terms of bail. And you see uh, 10, a report from the New York Post where 10 suspects, 10 people who were charged with crimes, committed almost 500 crimes since bail reform took effect. So she really needs to look in her own backyard uh, clearly before making comments, which I know is all about the state of New York, but certainly about across the country, because it's not helpful, and the city is seeing just outrageous increases in crime. Desiree, uh, why does it always feel like the Democrats are targeting the legal, lawful gun owners rather than targeting these violent criminals who are walking our streets? Democrats are targeting unfairness. Look, our cash bail system has only worked for the rich and the wealthy. If you can afford to bail yourself out of jail, then you get your get out of jail free card. If you're poor and you did not commit a crime, then you're stuck in the system. For example, Khalif Browder, he spent time in Rikers for a crime that he didn't commit, 700 days in solitary confinement, and later committed suicide. So there is a real problem that the governor and Democrats across the country are trying to address. And look, judges do have uh, judicial discretion. That does exist, and they can decide when and where uh, someone should get bail and be able to walk the streets. Look, the cops have a tough job, and we'll continue to see this uh, go throughout the cycle. I know Republicans are running on bail reform. Uh, but that is something that only helps the wealthy. Well, I don't think that quite addresses the question. Why are they targeting lawful wow. gun owners <laughs> rather than those that are using guns violently that hold them illegally to carry out crimes? They let them back on the street. And on the national scale, not just locally here in New York City, on a national scale, the Wall Street Journal editorial uh, board is calling out President Biden for his response to crime control and his speech this week saying the president misidentified the crime culprit, quote, Mr. Biden was at pains Tuesday to neutralize the perception that Democrats want to defund the police. That's a welcome line, but remember that in 2020, such sentiments were hearsay in the Democratic Party. The problem is that Mr. Biden didn't offer any serious ideas to improve law enforcement. Mr. Biden's speech was an exercise in damage control, not crime control. Because, Gianno, can you point to any one policy? Uh, that has been implemented by this White House that is effectively targeting criminals. No, and they, they don't want to mention that. I mean, we talked about this just yesterday. Democrats, and this across the country, they believe that calling criminals is the way to get elected and the way to stay elected. And we've seen that demonstrated 
time and time again. You look at Kamala Harris chip into this <coughs> bail fund, which I guess they raised about $40 million, and some of the people that were let out of jail committed more crimes, and I believe one committed a murder. So when you consider the fact that they believe that this is a popular issue or was a popular issue in 2020, but now they've seen the results with suburban voters, especially suburban women, who have said <coughs> enough is enough. My kids shouldn't, they shouldn't be in fear of going to school every day, which is a lot of things that, that children fear in Chicago and in places like New York. They need to speak up loudly and clearly, but they lost that opportunity. So now Republicans have been saying, no, we don't need to defund our police. We need to strengthen the policies and fund our police. But at the same time, Democrats have lost lost the microphone on this one. Well, and while this White House uh, continues to have a lot of crises on its plate, it seems to continue to prioritize one thing, and that is uh, electric cars and moving in that direction of cleaner green energy in this country, no matter the cost. A massive heat wave is putting California's electric car hypocrisy on full display, meanwhile. Governor <coughs> Gavin Newsom now asking Californians to restrict electricity use from 4 to 9 p.m. every single day. This comes just after the state banned the purchase of new <coughs> gas-powered vehicles by the year 2035. A new op-ed with the headline, No Fun in the California Sun, quote, heat waves aren't unusual. And not long ago, California and other states were able to manage through them without having to resort to emergency measures. No more. <coughs> Better hold on to that gas guzzler if you want to drive to the beach to escape the heat. House Republican Whip Steve Scalise sounding off on this tweeting quote, this is what Democrat control looks like and they want it nationwide. What a joke. You know, no matter where you stand on this issue, what we see, Desiree, is the party continuing to move this direction while the market can't support it. Look, what is happening is we are in a situation where climate change is real and governors and policymakers are trying to make decisions that will allow us to continue to enjoy the air we breathe and the water we drink and the lands we cherish. And we know right now what we're doing isn't working. So governor asking everyone to play their uh, fair share and do what they can to help save the planet, I think is a good thing. It's not something we should penalize. And I also want to go back to something Gianno said. He mentioned suburban women. Um, having a reckoning. Well, I think that comes from the Supreme Court and Republicans leaning into taking away uh, their rights. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Jana? Virtual signaling, virtual signaling, and I can clearly see that the Democratic Party has become the party of the elites because I don't know many people in places like Compton and other places in California that can afford to spend $75,000 on an electric vehicle. So, I mean, when you think about what they're doing to people, they're placing a tax on them, and they're really uh, disenfranchising the poor. So it makes no sense to me what they're doing. It doesn't make sense to many other people either. Yeah, uh, it there is expensive. There are people in Mississippi right now who don't have clean water because of poor decisions by Republican governors. So Okay, so there's a debate that's going to continue, and this surely is going to show up as one of the priorities uh, come the midterm elections for voters. We'll be watching it. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Gianno, Desiree, thank, thank you. you. All right, critics slamming the president for not showing up to work so much. A new report shows just how much me time the commander in chief has enjoyed. Plus, there will likely be more than this when the president speaks tonight. MAGA Republicans don't just threaten our personal rights and economic security, they're a threat to our very democracy. Let me tell you about this ultra MAGA agenda. It's extreme, as most MAGA things are. And the White House now defending those attacks and aim, naming, checking, checking Republicans from the briefing room podium. Mark Thiessen has got some strong thoughts on this. He'll join us next. I got a few things that, uh, that the Lord's leading me to basically say pertaining to these problems. As I have said before, what COVID has done, it has accelerated a great deal of the things that we was already dealing with at the time, but we wasn't looking at at the time. And I'm just going to use this for a quick example. 
we was already dealing with a 6-6 society, just like it talks about in the first four chapters of Revelations, to repent, 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 or else I will throw thee off into a sickbed. This sickbed was already here way before two and a half years ago, whenever COVID wound up emerging into a great deal of people's lives all over the planet. This sickbed isn't just uh, people with with uh, um, delicacy or or uh, people with cancer or people with tuberculosis or people with with uh, polio and all these other different diseases. Um, not just pertaining to heart heart failure, not just pertaining to hardening of the arteries, pertaining to people losing their minds and not remembering who they are, but we was already a sick, sick society way before COVID ever hit. It just so happens COVID gave everybody a, 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 a rest, I'm going to use that terminology, gave everybody a rest to the degree that now we started looking around and wondering, well, where have we went wrong? What are we doing here? What is going on? Uh, who are the who's and the what's and the when's and the where's? What exactly is happening here? You know, I just got to explaining to an individual last night that was reading over some of my uh, legal lit literature. He hadn't finished yet. That uh, we're dealing with a society right now that is heading down a cliff in the sense of a runaway train. And it's very few people that can see the trees for the forest, and that is the primary purpose that God sends forth messengers, he sends forth prophets, he sends forth people to help to enlighten or open those people's eyes. We see that one of the one of the main illustrations of people being blind was during the great flood whenever God spoke to Noah towards build a boat that I'm going to punish them. And the way I'm going to punish them, I'm going to punish them by allowing for a great flood to fall up into the land. Well, Noah preached and preached and preached and they made fun and they scorned him and they dehumanized him and, and they demonized him and all the above until that final last nail went to that ark and God himself drawed all the animals into the ark, which I know sounds, it sounds illogical to a lot of people that don't have the faith in believing in God, but God hur uh, hur hurled in the animals, the birds and everything else into that ark. Uh, and basically it was God that shut the big door. And whenever the door shut, that's whenever it began to rain. And rain, and rain, and rain. Now, God created that rain. Because up until then, rain was actually unheard of. Yes, they had vegetation. Yes, they had crops. Yes, there was always always been seas pertaining to mammal life and stuff like that. But as far as it raining, rain did not exist, according to the Bible, up until the Great Flood. God created the rains. In creating the rains, God looked upon that particular creation and said, you know what, this is a good thing to bring rain other than, other than the vegetation relying upon nothing but heavy dews at night in the mornings. Um, now God brings adequate rains. Well, in the adjustment of bringing that rain, okay, our global analogy was completely, totally different than what it is today. And I realize that a lot of preachers contradict what I'm fixing to say because they say that God is the creation of all things and God is creating these harshnesses that we're seeing with all these other problems pertaining to natural catastrophes. Well, my opinion about that is that if God is actually doing this, towards punishing humanity by either starving us away from all moisture with the world heating up the way that it is or God allowing for these deluges 
if, if God is actually the one that's, that's bringing this on, that's doing this, I really don't want to have no part of that kind of a God. You know why? Because the God that I read about is a God, a merciful God. He is a gracious God. Just like whenever Jesus hung on the cross, one of his final words was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, whenever it comes to God winking over our ignorances, that is limited towards how far God will actually go, and that includes myself, and things that I'm still fighting with in the flesh today, that I know that I'm going to have to give an account for one day if I don't completely uh, overcome these obstacles that I'm dealing with in the flesh. And, you know, you can, you can have the same thing in your mind or in your heart towards not loving your neighbor or not being forgiving or not having love or, or you just can't get over a, a particular thing that happened in your life protect, with, with, with some particular individual. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can bother a person that can be a burdensome to them. But what we're doing right now to the planet is not of God. If anything, God is actually still intervening towards not allowing for the planet to basically either explode or deplode. One of the other is just as bad. It's basically the end of human, human uh, civilization. Right now, the way I understand it, there's something like 60 some odd volcanoes that is actively spewing out lava, and hot, hot vo volcanic uh, activity, or it's steaming out a great deal of steam and releasing pressure. <clears throat> if the world was not responding and reacting that way, do you realize what the world would do? It would be just like a balloon that you kept blowing up and you kept getting the balloon bigger and bigger and bigger until one day, once that pressure exceeds a certain amount to the point that the interior uh, fa fabric that that, that that plastic is made out of, which creates that balloon, will pop. And once it pops, that will be an explosion. So because God has engineered the planet the way that he has, even though we're very, very arrogant and we're very, very hard-headed, <clears throat> without those volcanic eruptions right now, we would all basically be doomed. I mean totally doomed to the point that this world would just keep getting hotter and hotter and until finally, whenever it did give, it wouldn't just give partially, it would give all the way. And it would either do this or it would possibly do this. I don't know which. Uh, because one, uh, looking at the... Um, at the... Uh, artificial mechanics towards how things react and how things uh, re-react pertaining to heat and cold and etc. Uh, can actually be contrary to each other depending upon the moisture content, depending upon, um, depending upon the temperature, and it, depending upon the su surrounding circumstances. I believe that God, and I've said this before on video, and I'll say it again, I believe that the Lord has basically scratched his head for the last time and said, you know what, that protection that I was protecting the homo sapiens because of their ignorance, I'm no longer going to wink over that ignorance. Because we've had enough time through research, through NASA, NOMAN, uh, NORAD, and, and other military installations all over the world, including uh, the meteorologist and etc. We've had enough time to make advanced changes way, way before now. And it has only been because of greed and the big uh, oil uh, typhoons pertaining to the conglomerates that has basically helped to blind a great deal of society, not just here in America, but the world, in thinking that we wasn't damaging the world, that we wasn't damaging the very, the very uh, creation that God had helped to create. Now, since the atmosphere has become like, 
I'm going to estimate somewhere between 5 and 7 degrees hotter above the cloud level going to the, uh, to the ozone layer. <clears throat> now, we're seeing a radical imbalances uh, in, in, in pertaining to the fundamentals of the gravity of law let's just use that for an illustration, of the gravity of, of, of our uh, natural resources pertaining to uh, our upper atmosphere. Now we're seeing it change right before our very eyes, and it's doing it just like that. One reason why that it's doing that is because we went through a slumpering slope during COVID. During COVID, probably in exchange of what was actually happening, not just here in America, but throughout the world, basically the world shut down and there wasn't but about a third of the world that was actually performing in its normal resources pertaining to cargo being moved, people working at, at ships and, and uh, ports and, and farmers were still having to farm, uh, school teachers were still having to school to teach school, but they was teaching school in a different format, even though the people over in Sweden was not. Um, there was a lots of things that slowed down, including airplane traffic. Airplane traffic went through a tremendous slowdown other than the big cargo planes. And of course you have the FedEx and, and stuff like that, the big planes that carry mail from one destination to another. But even even the, the cargo boats uh, transporting goods slow down. The world slowed down. And there wasn't near as much carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere. During 9-11, which is coming up because today's the first day of September, the United States president shut down aviation because of us being attacked pertaining to the Twin Towers, 9-11. We know for a fact pertaining to science, pertaining to NOVA, pertaining to NASA, pertaining to other uh, scientific um, meteorologists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that basically the ozone layer started healing itself. Instead of it being five miles thick, it got five and a half uh, miles thick. And then it got almost six miles thick pertaining to what went on during 9-11. We know this for a fact because there was a pattern and scientists even made that known publicly that basically the ozone layer was healing itself. Well, the reason why is because all the carbon dioxide basically shut down during that time whenever aviation come to a halt. As soon as we went back into the same old, same old after 9-11, that same healing effect started diminishing, started started getting, instead of it being six miles, it went to five and a half miles, and then went from five and a half miles to five miles. Every time you do that, you are eliminating the protection that God has placed with the uh, anti-gravity, anti-mechanical uh, uh, protection shield over this planet Earth. Every time that, that ozone layer diminishes and gets thinner, it allows for more heat to escape through the ozone as well as other particles that become lethal pertaining to ca uh, cancer causing uh, radiation <clears throat> that can actually disturb the ecosystem here on the planet to the point that I think it was over in Australia a few years ago where they started no noticing that frogs started having two heads or tadpoles was doing this, or different species was acting in a completely abnormal, uh, abnormal way, and they pinpointed that was because of the ozone layer, as well as the uh, the skin cancer that 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 can relate to. Now scientists are hell bent now since they have awakened in trying to convince the American public that our damages is coming from our, our, uh, our automobiles, our trucks, our planes, our trains, 
anything that's putting carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. I mean, I just heard the other day where, uh, where a uh, energy producing electrical system plant was going to shut down three years ahead of itself. And I'm sure the reason why is the same reason why that they shut down the TVA plant over here in Humphreys County going towards uh, uh, basically just on the other side of Tennessee River that's classified as being Middle Tennessee. They shut that down. They shut that uh, electrical producing uh, plant down because of all the, all the waste that it was putting up into the atmosphere. That's only part of it. The other part were the thinning of the ozone. Think of the crude petroleum oil that is below our feet, ordinarily below our water table, that goes down to some places, probably five, six, maybe a thousand feet down in the ground. But everything below that point, you have gas chambers and you have oil uh, petroleum oil products down there that to this day they're still drilling and they're still trying to uh, incaptivate those materials and bring them out so that we can use them. As they're doing this we know for a fact that the oil was not put there by, uh, by Dino the dinosaurs but it was put there to eliminate friction because our earth is basically a living organism and it's in constant mole towards either swelling or retracting or shifting or moving. We got the high tides, we got the low tides, depending upon how close we are to the moon. To me, the moon is nothing more than a, than a tail on a kite that if something was to ever happen to the moon, we would basically be destroyed. Either we would float either too close to the sun's atmosphere and burn up, or we would float away from the sun in the degree of, of basically freezing to death. But as we're draining the oil substances, the, the crude uh, petroleum oil out of the ground, that basically, if, if you've ever seen it, whenever it comes out of the ground, it's basically like molasses. I mean, it's, it's just, it's very, very thick and it's soupy looking. As we're draining that oil, we're draining that heat shield. And you may be saying a heat shield. Oh yeah, there's a heat shield. That heat shield was placed there to eliminate the heat that's in the center of the core that is in constant rage pertaining to fire and, and lava and brimstone down there that once more this centrifugal force is going in one direction that basically creates our poles, North Pole, South Pole. Now, Edgar Casey, for some reason, was given a vision that the poles would actually reverse. And some scientists believe that that has already occurred, that the poles would actually reverse. <clears throat> well, with what we're doing by eliminating that oil shield, and we're eliminating uh, the oil from eliminating the friction, and friction causes heat, now the heat is coming from the inside out towards warming up our planet. And the reason why I know this is because it actually corresponds in the opposite direction that in the summer months, depending upon what side of the equator you're on, we actually move closer to the sun and in the winter, we actually go, uh, no, excuse me, it's just the opposite way. In the summer months, we go further away from the sun, and in the winter months, we get closer to the sun. If something ever happens to that, that order, kind of like gravity, the order of gravity, what comes up must come down, we will see eradical weather bearing changes here on the planet like you could not ever even begin to imagine towards stuff breaking 
stuff falling apart and seeing abnormalities not only with our upper atmosphere that's now holding that much more moisture and because the heat is accelerating that moisture it's going up higher and then whenever it releases ordinarily it don't release it just a little drop at a two at a time it all comes down at one time and that's what's causing these deluges but if that <coughs> centrifugal inner force called the mantle in the center of the earth if that was to ever reverse it would cause catastrophic damages up onto this planet that is unimaginable towards our seas our tidal waves, uh, the high tides would even be like three times more higher. They're saying right now, if we was to stop right now, right now, and everybody all over the planet, no longer using any fossil fuel, the damages that we've already done done to our planet, according to what I heard yesterday, pertaining to the ice that's melting up towards Greenland and Ireland and up, up in the northern plains, that if we was to stop right now, that we would, be expecting for the ocean level to rise at least 11.7 inches, almost a foot. So we're in this, <clears throat> we're in this pattern right now. We're in this doomsday pattern that now a lot of countries are beginning to awaken towards realizing, oh my God, there really is something to all this. Oh yeah, there really is. We was foretold 30 plus years ago the damages that we're doing to our atmosphere, the damages that we're doing to our planet. And and I still contradict uh, uh, an investigator that, that I know very well that is contrary to the facts of believing that what we're doing to the planet is not of mankind. And the reason why that I can say that, based around Scripture, is if you'll go over into the book of Revelations and read it, it talks about how God will come back to destroy humanity because of the way that humanity is destroying the planet. Why would a God, why would have a God that created all things as far as the eye can see, and as far as what we can hear, smell, touch, and be a part of, why would have a God put out a warning, a declaration, by telling humanity pertaining to, uh, pertaining to uh, the inhabitants here upon the earth, why would he ever said that if it was based around impossibilities that human humanitarian that hum that the homo sapiens uh here upon to the planet could not harm or hurt or destroy the planet that's just it he never would have put that in there we are harming the earth we are destroying certain things on the atmosphere because out of greed and selfishness they have put this on the back burner and they was thinking well if we'll take it and put it over here kind of like out of sight out of mind We'll just forget about it and we'll pass the buck and we'll just deal with it maybe later on down the road, providing that it uh, winds up uh, catching up with us. Well, it's caught up with us. It has truly caught up with us pertaining to these changes that are now irregular, not just with Mother Nature pertaining to the things that's going on above to the or down to the earth, but the things that are going on beneath that are now surfacing out to the top. And the main ingredients of that is heat. And the reason why I say that is because even in the winter time, whenever the earth has, has, uh, has changed its direction, pertaining to the, the, the flow of the axis, if the sun was doing this, number one, first of all, we wouldn't be able to go outside and work, play, and, and, and live out our lives the way that we do without getting either second, third, or fourth degree burns. I'm pretty sure after you receive a fourth degree burn, you're basically already dead because now you went through the three different layers of skin and now you're basically down to the, to the, to the tissue, to the, to the part that actually is going to kill you. 
because your body won't be able to withstand but just so much so much uh stress and so much uh, uh tension and so much uh basically going going in, in, into a state of uh shock your body won't take but just so much and then the heart the mind will basically uh override the heart and the heart will basically shut down and you'll die because you can't you can't bear that type of pain <clears throat> What we're doing is that the Lord has basically lifted his hand of protection off of this planet. And the reason why that he's done this is because of the way that the homo sapiens down here are pretending to serve God. And they're not truly, uniquely sincere in the way that they're serving the Lord. The Bible says that the Father seeketh those who worship him in truth and in spirit. I realize because of the chemical inducements that has happened in the 20th and the 21st century that it makes it that much more tougher and that much more harder for people to turn from this lifestyle over to this lifestyle and think that they're going to do it overnight. Because unless there is a supernatural intervention that happens in that person's life, and which can happen, it's going to take a period of days, weeks, and months before you're going to get that person turned around because of the chemical inducements that has befallen up into all of our lives. And don't think for a second that you're exempt from that because if you even pick up a pop bottle or drink a cup of coffee or, or you drink or eat anything that's basically coming from, from any of the grocery stores or any of the markets, you're basically being exposed to chemicals. This world, since the uh, since the medicine man uh, has has really taken off in some ways for the good, like creating penicillin, etc., uh, having shots that that we thought that actually could eradicate uh, polio, etc. Stem cell research, as well as um, having other types of forms of treatments that can help people in various things. A lot of those things are good, but keep in mind, we're still dealing with a society unlike any other society living in any other era. At the same time that you're keeping up with that, pertaining to all the chemicals, Keep in mind that Satan has never been put down. The Antichrist, Luciferian Lucifer, is still alive, just as alive as well today as what he was whenever he first got kicked out of heaven, whenever he decided to contaminate the Garden of Eden pertaining to Adam and Eve. A matter of fact, if he's done anything, he has become more craftier, more wiser, more powerfuler. And he has um, evolved, would be a good word, uh, intensified to the point that now he has blinded a great deal of society with all the greed, with all the other stuff, all the pleasures of the flesh. And now we're starting to realize what's going on. Even the Bible, go back to that same book of Revelations in the King James Version, talks about how that Lucifer... The Antichrist will come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. And he, and whenever I say he's coming down in great wrath, I'm just not talking about a massive shooter like happened in Las Vegas that decides to kick, kick out the window and kill 60-something people and spray about 2,000. I'm not talking about somebody went into a theater in Denver, Colorado, or somebody went into a church while people was praying in, in uh, uh, South Carolina. I'm talking about the storms, the sequence of the storms that is now creating these deluges or the cap the capturation of the solar system not being able to bring adequate rains when we need the rains because now everything has become abnormal. Why has it become abnormal? Because of the things that we're doing to the earth and the things that we're doing to the things above us pertaining to our atmosphere. Now, does that mean that we're all doomed? We've come close. We really have towards this runaway train 
that now is set a sail towards destruction. But I still have faith in mankind, and I know that I have faith in God, that if we will submit our hearts and our lives over to God, God will give us the ability to know what to create, what not to create, what to do, when to do it, how to do it. You know, a lot of people uh, buck up against the, uh, the medical industry. And they'll say, well, if God intended for me to die that way, I'll just die that way. Well, that's a very naive, narrow-minded way of thinking about it. And I guess in one way, maybe you're right. But at the same time, who was it that gave that knowledge to that doctor? Who was it that gave that knowledge to that scientist? Who was it that adapted that person so that that person would know just exactly the chemical compound that it would take to, to possibly... Um, respond in a positive way to the degree that maybe they could help to settle down some of the problems going on in a person's internal life, pretending to what's going on with them physically. Now, whenever I go to the YMCA, and I'm still a member even though I hadn't been out there very much this year at all, because I've been so solely active out here. One of the first things that I admired about the YMCA going back years and years ago, whenever I was first living in Jackson, Tennessee, between the year 1995 and 2005, is that the YMCA practices three different levels of the body as a pyramid. The mind, the body, and the spirit. Mind, the body, and the spirit indicating that there's more to us other than the physical compound. We have emotional, and then we have psychological. The psychological comes from here. The emotional comes from here. The physical comes from here. Once more, the pyramid. Mind, body, and spirit. These are the three adaptable uh, compounds that make every human being on the planet, regardless whether you speak American, or you're an American, or you're from another country. We all are designed the same way. We may not speak the same language. We may not be the same color. We may not have the same opinions. We may dress completely different. We Our appetite, our, our uh, uh, style of how that we want to live may be totally different. But I guarantee you that pyramid exists in all cultures. Mind, body, spirit. If you do not heal the heart, which is associated, excuse me for a second, which is associated with the mind, the mind and the heart is associated with the flesh pertaining to the body. If you do not start to clean the cup, as Jesus said, from the inside, you'll never be able to clean the cup from the outside. I think it was the Philistines, or maybe it was the uh, Sadducees, that that believed in worshiping God out of tradition more so than with the heart. And one of the illustrations in the Bible that, that illustrates this very, 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 very plainly is that they wanted to shun, demonize, and dehumanize Jesus Christ because he sat at a table and began to eat with his fingers and he never washed. And they was going to ridicule him. Hey, what you're doing is unclean. You didn't even wash your hands, which we know today uh, from a hygiene standpoint, it's best if you can wash your hands. But let's say, hypothetically speaking, that you're in an area where there is no water and you just can't wash your hands. Maybe you just need to take your hands and just wipe them on your shirt, providing that your shirt's clean, or find a towel or something and just kind of clean yourself off a little bit. Now we've got all kinds of elements, once more, based around chemicals, just like this uh, uh, sanitation. Uh, jail right here that you squirt a couple drops on there and then you rub your hands together okay and then you 
you pull it in between your fingers, you pull it in between your thumbs, you basically get it all over your hands, and then you let it dry naturally. You don't try to wipe it off because that's the whole purpose for that sanitizing, because if there's any germs on them hands, not necessarily dirt, but germs, and the germs is what will make people sick, is that it will sanitize those germs to the fact that it will kill them. We know that today. They didn't know that back then. But they was trying to prejudge Jesus on the fact that he didn't wash his hands. And Jesus spoke up real, real quick against these people that does stuff out of tradition versus doing it with their heart. And he said about the cup, he used the cup as an illustration that you can try to clean the cup from the outside, but you'll never clean it from the inside. You have to begin on the inside and then once you have cleaned the cup from the inside, then the outside will basically take care of itself. It's kind of like what my grandmother, my, what my grandfather used to always tell us grandkids whenever we was uh, shucking corn and throwing it in a wagon. Uh, we would try to fill up the back end before we'd fill up the front end. And I guess it was a psychological thing at the time in thinking, well, if we hurry up and fill up this back end of the wagon, we can go home earlier. Because now it will give the appearances that the wagon is full. Well, only an idiot's going to think that. Because anybody can look over the wagon and tell, wow, the back end's loaded, but the front end isn't. So my grandfather had a saying. He said, son, don't worry about the back end of the wagon. The back end of the wagon would take care of itself. Just worry about the front end. And that's what we started doing. We started uh, loading that wagon with corn that we would dismantle from the stalks and we would throw it in there for the horses and the cows because they didn't have all the sophisticated stuff like they have today pertaining to combining and and stuff like that they did come out with a uh, i think it was a one row maybe a two row uh, deal to where it would actually go through this this uh type of combine but it wasn't actually a combine because it didn't take none of the kernels off the ear but what it would do it would it would uh basically shuck it as it was going through, because it had scrubbers and stuff inside of it, and this thing would throw that cob of corn over in the wagon and fill the wagon up by itself, all, all in the sense of uh, of uh, inventions from mankind, mechanical mechanical inventions. That didn't come out until later on. So we was loading the wagon up, and we realized, wow, if you go ahead and fill the front end of the wagon up, sure enough, Grandpa was right, the back end would take care of itself. Well, it's the same thing as Jesus was talking about towards cleaning the cup from within. If you clean that cup from within, and I'm using the cup as an illustration of the body, pertaining to the mind and the heart, those two items will clean the rest of the items up. You don't do it from the outside in, you do it from the inside out. That's my whole concept about the planet Earth, that until we can convince all races throughout the planet, including China, that what we actually are doing to the planet is damaging the planet, and by damaging the planet, we're damaging ourselves, until we can convince the superpowers and the conglomerates of this, we're only basically um, whistling Dixie, the South used to say, and we are beating empty chimes towards pretending like we're, we're actually wanting to do something about the problem, but in actuality we're th that we're not. I am so, solely, so afraid. Not from a spirituality standpoint because I know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I am so concerned about what's going on right now over in Ukraine pertaining to that nuclear plant in thinking that if that was to ever blow up or melt down and radiation started spewing everywhere and people started dropping like flies because of sickness of radiation or cancer or whatever, that once that war over there escalated and got so far out of hand to the point that basically it was creating a doomsday scenario for everybody, that that would basically uh, trigger 
some of your government officials by thinking, well, rather than allow for them to suffer the way that they're suffering, why don't we just all push the buttons at one time and end this thing? In other words, create a nuclear uh, a nuclear holocaust that would basically uh, destroy the the face of the earth and destroy everything, all life on, on the planet earth. There would only be a few things that would survive, and I don't think that they would survive for long, maybe 50, maybe 100 years, but eventually the radiation would be so so lethal that, that it would kill them too. And I'm talking about the whales, I'm talking about the, the squids, I'm talking about uh, uh, the birds, I'm talking about the worms, I'm talking about the, the cockroaches, I'm talking about everything that that doomsday scenario would be more likely if that plant melts down and starts spewing out radiation. So what we need to do is cut it off at the chase, as my grandfather used to always say, a stitch in time saves nine, and prevent from that occurring over in the Ukraine area pertaining to that nuclear plant because it would give humanity less lessons, lessons to be learned and less of a reason to want to push the nuclear football bomb and all these nuclear countries blow themselves up and kill themselves all at the same time. That's the very, very worst case scenario in that particular order that could happen. What did I say a while ago? Before God ever makes a move, he allows for ministers, prophets, preachers, teachers, messengers to come forth with the message to try to prevent society from ruining itself and making one of the biggest, greatest errors that it's ever made. And of course, we can see where towns has been destroyed uh, um, um, we can see where villages um, that that you know it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah that got destroyed, but there's been other other uh, cultures and cities and 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 big uh, Greek mythology type uh, uh, deals that has been destroyed that now we're figuring out ain't mythology, but it's actually facts. <clears throat> Scientists have dug down where the where the city of Sodom and Gomorrah has. A certain amount of feet, I think it was like six feet, and they have found nothing but sulfur, burning sulfur uh, for about, you know, two inches thick that basically uh, verifies or supports the history of the Bible, that that community or that city was destroyed that way. We can verify that the world was flooded at one time because the only way to have fossils is with water, and we have found fossils. 14, 15, 16,000 feet high in the Rockies that indicates that at one time that area had to be underwater. So there's too many facts here that people need to look at, just like the fact that where it says that God will come back and will destroy them who are destroying the earth. God would have never, ever have said that if it was not possible for the human race to actually bring destruction up onto itself and bring destruction up onto the earth. Now, since we got all that out in the open, where do we go from here? What do we do now? First of all, we need to follow the guidelines that, yes, I, I, you know, as badly as I don't want to say it, Biden has produced, pertaining to the Democrats, pertaining to the Green New Deal. That's step number one. Step number two, because of the knowledge and the wisdom that we do have pertaining to the Internet, social media platforms, we need to rely more on, on social media teaching as well as social media programs and that includes talking to people, even though you may have relatives in England or, or Turkey or Europeans or, or wherever, rather than get on an airplane ride and use up all that fuel and create all that carbon dioxide that basically creates those, uh, those, uh, streams, those streamliners uh, where you can see all that smoke and stuff going in behind all that stuff. 
rather than get on those airplanes and spend all that money that obviously you got, it would be best if you stayed at home. Once more, we can prove that the that the ozone started healing, not just during 9-11, where aviation was, was uh, banded for about two months here in America, but we can also prove that during COVID, of the hype of COVID, when everything slowed down, once more, the ozone layer started healing itself. It went from five miles to five and a half miles to six miles, and it started healing itself. I think originally, back when we first discovered the ozone layer, originally it was somewhere around 11 or 12 miles, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong about that, but I'm thinking to myself, when we first started all this stuff back in the 60s, the ozone layer was about twice as thick as what it is today. And that's going back, let's say, 50 years ago. Because I'm 61, I can remember as a young, young lad, whenever they started uh, exploring in space and taking the Apollos up and in, up into space, and whenever they uh, went around the moon and come back home, and then eventually they landed on the moon. We've gone a long way in 50 years, pertaining to all these artificial mechanics, pertaining to all this crude oil um, appetite that all these. Uh, inventions now are using in some form or fashion. We're going to have to work smarter rather than harder, and we're going to have to figure out other methods if we're going to be a survival uh, a survival entity up onto this planet, because not only are we harming ourselves, but we're harming other things too as well. We know that during the hype of COVID that the ozone layer started healing. Just like we know now since basically we have taken off the brakes off of COVID and people has gotten back into the flow towards trying to normalize their lives, which means driving more uh, taking more airplane rides, taking more cruises, et cetera, et cetera, which means that more people's going to have to work at the ports because they're going to be bringing in more cargo off of the ships. We know that now, since everything has exploded again, accelerated, the damages that we're doing to the ozone layer is a phenomenon. It is absolutely a phenomenon that is happening all over the world. Uh, just within a week or so ago, I think it was Afghanistan. No, not Afghanistan, Pakistan. That got hit by a thousand-year flood that destroyed over a million uh, buildings, structures. I think the last time I looked, it was like eleven or 1,200 people that was dead. But that whole area will now have to struggle towards surviving just like in places like um, Puerto Rico or Cuba or other islands out there that's been recently hit by massive uh, hurricanes, just like the people in Waverly, Tennessee, that recently went through 17 and a half inches of rain in like six hours last year, just like the people over in eastern Kentucky, just like other people that has went through other things. You know, uh, Two weeks before Christmas, we got hit by a tornado that stayed on the ground for 250 miles that basically killed over, I think it was over 100 people, if I'm not mistaken, in Kentucky alone. Killed, you know, a few people here. Uh, thank God it didn't kill as many people here. But a day before Christmas, because of Colorado being nothing but a tinderbox right now, compounded with the beetles that has killed all the trees, it has made that whole area over there very, very vulnerable to to the degree that um, that they have massive wildfires over there too that gets, gets out of hand, that just this past Christmas, this is the year 2022, this is September the 1st, a uh, structure fire started. They don't know how. They think maybe it may have been because of somebody cooking outdoors. Anyways, the wind was blowing like 70, 80 miles an hour, and it just came at the right time with the humidity being just right to the point that it basically destroyed, I believe, a thousand structures. 
within like three or four hours because it was going from house to house to community to community to road to road to yard to yard. We've had the same similar type of situations happen up here in eastern Tennessee in 2015. I think it was 2015, may have been 2014. Whenever uh, that's a hot and dry in the Appalachian Mountains, they're towards Silver City and, and Dollywood and, and uh, Pigeon Ford and etc. We've had the same type of scenarios. Thank God that God has allowed for the rains to still fall this side of the Mississippi more so than the rains have not been falling on the other side of the Mississippi. But eventually even that could change too. We know for a fact that all the waterways pertaining to the water reservoirs, the rivers, etc., are getting lower and lower and lower. We know for a fact that the aquadors that are basically underground channels up underneath our feet are drying up, coming from Kansas, going down through Oklahoma and down through other places of Texas because of all the irrigations that they're using, especially out in California. We know for a fact that there's a big lake, I don't remember the name of it right now, that helps supply 28 plus million people in the country of Mexico, pertaining to Mexico City, that went from this five years ago, now down to this. We know that the Ryan River over in Germany, that it has basically diminished to the point that hitting all time lows, uh, the Mississippi River, the last I looked over here by Tiptonville, it was down to about eight foot. I think after it gets down to about six or five foot, it basically stops barge, barges from going up and down the river. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I picked up on a report, uh, WPSD News, where the, the ferries had already done stopped, or one of them had stopped, I think, maybe the other one, which I don't even know where that one is. Only, I'm only familiar with this one up here by uh, um, Kentucky, um, Hickman, Kentucky. There, there's, a, there's a ferry. Um, I ain't familiar with the other one, but I'm pr pretty sure that there's probably several different ferries that run up and down the Mississippi at different times because it's a money-making industry and people need to travel across the river and versus going all the way down to Dysburg and then going back up and then coming back up through, uh, through Missouri, basically the Delta of Missouri, just to get to places over here in Missouri. It's a whole lot cheaper to pay the 6 or 8 or $10 toll than it is to use up all that money and all that time on gas and we're at your vehicle. What's your point, you may be asking? What's your point, Dennis? My point is this. We are seeing right now a worldwide phenomenon that is now happening all over the world. We know for a fact that two or three years ago, Australia basically almost burnt completely up. It was so devastating and seeing all their vegetation go up into the air. Massive fires, just like we've had out west. We know for a fact that people are purposely burning up the rainforest so that they can create more farming territory. My point is this. If we do not awaken to the things that we are now facing, if we think that these things are suddenly going to go away or they're going to diminish on their own, you are only fooling yourself because they're not going to go away and they're not going to be diminished until we as a society decide to go back to the cross, just like the Bible talks about, and do thy first works over again and become knowledgeable towards letting the Holy Spirit drive us and influence us in the right way to go so we can battle these problems that we're facing, not just with the water shortages all over the planet pertaining to, to the good, clean drinking water, not just with the uh, 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 um, glaciers melting to the point that various low-lying areas, coastal low-lying areas are going to wind up having to uh, pay the, the, the immense consequences for, but all the above. From the fentanyl, from the from the uh, abortions, to us being thirty point seven trillion dollars in debt, to all our jobs going south, to all the drug overdoses and the suicides and the gun violence, and I could go down this long, long list. And I think the majority of people that get a hold of this material, mind, I think they'll already know part of this list. 
you already know probably 70% of the list of the things that are going on right now that have uh, accelerated just within the past two and a half, three years. Now you have to stop and ask yourself the question. Okay, if things are erratically changing this much within the past three to five years, what is it going to be like in the next three to five years if we're still on this runaway train and we're still heading towards doom and gloom? Because I promise you, once God gets enough of it, just like he talks about there in the first part of Revelations, we will go from an elevation of being a sick society to an elevation that will not only be a sick society, but we will go from an elevation to being a society thrown off into great tribulation. To me, the interpretation of great tribulation, in which, don't get me wrong, I'm sure the people that are homeless, I'm sure the people that has recently went through what they went through in Waverly, Tennessee, pertaining to the flooding, the people in eastern Kentucky, all the people's houses that got burnt out in Denver, Colorado, all the uh, uh, heating situations out towards California and, and Oregon and places like that uh, that's supposed to hit a, another triple digits this week. Um the situation with all the hurricanes and tornadoes and bad stuff that's hit all over the world, typhoons, um, tsunamis, etc., volcanoes erupting. I'm sure that even during the time of World War One and World War Two and other types of wars that our United States military service men and women had to go through, thought at the time that they was going through it that it was great tribulation I know that I've went through things in my life that I questioned whether or not this was it that this was going to be the end one of those times was the anniversary that is coming up pertaining to 9-11 on, on 20, 21 years ago I questioned the day that all that occurred and several days after just like the Y2K deal of whether or not this is going to be the end. There's going to be an end. And we are heading towards it every day. We are escalating towards that end and that tribulation every day. But my point is this. We can intervene in that destruction. We can intervene in that doomsday scenario if we will put our heads together And become united in a forceful way towards wanting to better our lives, better our relationships, and better the planet. It's really, it's really sickening to think that greed and the love of power and money has put us where we are right now towards being 30 years behind. And not only the NAFTA deal, but also people being blind to what we're actually doing to one another and what we're doing to our planet and what we're doing to our existence pertaining to the atmosphere that we're in. We can prolong this the same way that Jesus prolonged the death of Elijah that had already been put into the tomb and was already stinking because at that time they didn't have embalmment uh, techniques towards embalming the body the way that they do today. And by the time Jesus got to him, which is one of the shortest passages in the Bible, and Jesus wept because he cared for Elijah and he knew that others loved Elijah. Uh, it says in the Bible that Jesus wept. But Jesus intervened. He, interse he, he, he interceded in Elijah's death and brought Elijah back to life. And Elijah lived, according to the way I understand the Bible, approximately another 20 years after that. 
I'm sure with him coming that close to a life and death experience that Elijah's life was totally different from the time that he got resurrected from the time he actually died in comparison to the way that his life originally was before he died because he had that life altering experience and most anybody that has a life altering experience is going to be like me uh, you may think that they're um, dimwits you may think that they're Bible thumpers. You may think that they're uh, uh, spiritually obsessed or basically a, a, a holy roller or whatever, whatever category that you want to put, it, put us in. Uh, you may think that about me, and that's fine. But I myself have went through close encounters of death, and I've had that life-altering situation in my life and I know that I'd rather die standing up than to cower down and not do that in which what the Heavenly Father has called me to do to begin with which is give out these warnings and to tell people the things that I'm telling them about in these advisories in trying to stop this doomsday scenario it's almost like watching two trains coming together and one's going down one hill and around another corner, and you're above, you're in this helicopter, and you can see that they're getting closer and closer together, and it's just a matter of time before they're going to do this and that. They're going to destroy themselves. That's the type of scenario using that as an analogy towards what we're looking at pertaining to the world events. Unless we change. The Green New Deal may not be the answer to all the problems, but it is a beginning. But I still say, if you're relying upon man's theories and man's technical ways in, in surviving and getting through all of this, once more, you're only deceiving yourself because it's going to take the precious Holy Spirit that lives within our temples to enlighten our brains, to give us that wisdom and that knowledge towards what we should be doing, we should no longer be doing, and recreating a new uh, uh, facet uh, for transportation and life in general. I, I personally think that we should. it should be a law right now of stopping down and cutting any trees in America. And you may be saying, well, what are we going to use for... Uh, for materials towards building houses, I guarantee you it may cost a little bit more money, but I guarantee you they, they have aluminum pegs now that they can put up to take the place of two by fours. They've got other things that have been invented other than wood to the degree that you can build a sound home, a house, and not use probably a third of the wood in that home versus what they're doing today because they've got you know like a, a aluminum uh, um, fabric type shingles instead of using those shingles that they that uses so much petroleum oil in pertaining to the regular shingle um, they've got panels now that they can put on a house either inside or outside that has basically been compressed by these machines that is basically like fiberglass or something or something similar to that. In other words, the element of wood is not even there. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can do. We can we can uh, make plastic uh, gears that goes in a motor now that's made either out of hard, hard plastic or some other type of material similar towards um, fiberglass that is so strong that it takes the place of a metal gear to where at one time we used to use all metal in our motors. Now a lot of these motors is either created out of aluminum or this fiber type material that I'm talking about. Now there are certain things that we haven't yet established towards making camshafts and, and crankshafts and pistons and stuff like that out of these different elements or as far as I know that they're not out there. They may be 
in some of the uh, racing industry or the uh, aviation industry, they may have certain parts out there now that can literally not have no metal at all in it. That won't get near as hot. Um, the oil compounds uh, uh, that eliminates the friction, the friction, the friction won't be near as bad in some of these newer inventions than, than they are the older ones. And we just need to become more wiser. We need to become more smarter. We need to become more uh, um, uh, engineering, engineering, uh, in, ingenuity, engineering type uh, society to where if we haven't thought of it already, we need to invent it to to uh, put it into an existence pertaining to helping out society. Regardless whether it be aluminum uh, pegs taking the place of a two by four, or we're using different types of compounds now that, that we don't have to cut down all the trees. Um, it really makes me mad. Every time I go to my mailbox, I got a big mailbox, and I get a slew of mail about that thick every week. And most of it is coming from the credit card industries towards wanting me to apply towards credit card. That way they'll give me an extra $200 for signing up or $100 for signing up or $500 for signing up because I got a good credit rating. But it really makes me mad because every time I go to the mailbox, I realize, wow, why couldn't they have just told me that on my telephone and emailed me or sent it by messenger? We've got the tools. We've got the means right now to where we can turn this around. I truly believe that. I haven't lost faith in humanity. And if I did, I wouldn't be making this video right now. And I for darn sure got faith in God that God can give us those instructions, just like he gave the instructions to Noah and how to build that boat. God can give us the instructions towards pulling our way out of this hole then that illegitimately we have allowed for others to convince us or drag us off into. But we got to be willing to be willing. And you can't worship God out of some sort of tradition. Whenever people go to church to sing a song, they read this thing that the, that the, that the, uh, uh, um, bishop or the minister or the pope or whoever uh, gave them to read and they bow down they say they say this already written prayer and then they stand back up they sing another song and then the the, the minister or the the priest he'll say something and then the body of people are supposed to say something and then the priest will say something and the body of people will say have to say something that's all traditional and if you think that traditions is going to get you into heaven it's not you can go to church every day and do the same tradition every day. And if your heart is not sincere towards accepting the teachings of Christ and allowing for the Holy Spirit to become predominant in your life, you'll be one of those that will be knocking on the door one day saying, Lord, Lord, Please let me in. Please let me in. And you're going to hear this voice that's going to be one of the saddest days of the existence of humanity that's going to say, depart from me, for I've never known thee. That's going to be a sad day, especially after that final third resurrection when the Antichrist, Lucifer, will be slewed ultimately in the end, but before he gets slewed, in the way that he's going to be slewed, he's going to be thrown into the pits of hell. It will basically be the end of his existence towards being able to influence humanity anymore. Um, that part will be slewed. It will be taken. But before that happens, he's going to draw that many more people into following him again into the great battle of Armageddon, which is basically a spiritual battle. Yes, it does talk about a major physical battle pertaining to the river Euphrates, but it ultimately will wind up into a spiritual battle, a supernatural battle on the third resurrection whenever the Bible says that all, including the sea, will give up its dead. Anything that's ever come into an existence since the beginning of time that has mind, body, and spirit will be resurrected 
and they'll be giving one final ultimate chance of proving themselves whether or not they're antichrist or rather not they're truly of the Lord's. And this is God's way of weaning or separating the wheat from the shaft or separating the men from the boys or separating the women from the girls. This is not my plan. This is his plan. This is the divine one's plan. All I am is the messenger to the plan. And all I can do is do like I'm doing right now by making these uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook uh, platforms and putting it out there. And hopefully one day somebody will get a hold of this information and they'll either try to call me at 731-699-0913 or they'll come to 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255 and we'll be able to sit down and partner up and be able to work together towards becoming united. United we stand, divided we fall. I don't forgot now how that the brother that I was at his house last night that's reading a great deal of my material, I don't forgot now how he expressed it, but he said something about like we're going to have to hang in together and if we don't all hang in together, eventually we ourselves will be hung. Whenever you get to looking at the crime, the drugs, the gangs, whenever you get to looking at the illegitimate uh, compartments or departments pertaining to our government officials, regardless whether it's federal, state, or local, we are almost at the brink right now of a total breakdown. And I guess in, in some way or another, because of all the death and destruction that's happening, because of one reason or the other, they have done everything but announce that we are actually at the point of a civil war of the president declaring martial law. And don't think for a second that we're not exempt from that happening. Because I can see where all these other countries are falling apart. Uh, I see where the Zulus, the headhunters, has come back out in Africa. I see where cannibalism has become known in some of the third world countries, even South America, if I'm not mistaken. I see where these rivers and canals and these waterway systems, these uh, aqua doors are drying up. We're going to have to raise a red flag as the watchman on the wall, and we're going to have to put aside a bit of our pride and we're going to have to stick together because if we don't we're heading towards those two cabooses colliding and once it collides it will be just like that factory I point that way in actuality it's shorter that way going towards the east up towards New York and Boston Eventually, if they continue on the path that they're on, there will be a meltdown of that nuclear factory. And whenever that happens, that's going to open up a brand new venue towards what people are going to be willing to do that they wasn't willing to do before that occurred over in that area. I want to say thank you for listening. I realize that this has been an intense September the 1st, 2022, year 2022 message basically 10 days before 9-11. I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for your prayers. And good luck to each and every one of us as we strive towards a closer, everlasting relationship with the Heavenly Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. Knowing that if we're going to do anything, it has to begin from within our own souls towards cleaning the inside of that cup before we're ever, ever going to exceed to the outside layers towards cleaning up the outside. Thanks again and good luck to all of us. Shalom. God bless America. God bless our troops. God bless America's endeavors. And hallelujah to the only remaining risen living Savior, which is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God bless you.
and God bless America.